Welcome to This Too Shall Suck podcast, a fresh perspective on grief. I'm Lauren Denise, just your average millennial out here trying to have a conversation about a taboo topic that nobody wants to talk about. It's important to know that grief doesn't just happen when you lose someone. It can happen at any moment in your life. And it doesn't have to be all bad. It can actually be a really beautiful process. And as a millennial who had to process our own grief, I knew it was important to bring a more lighthearted, fresh perspective and create a safe space to discuss a topic that is typically uneasy. As I always like to say, we like to talk about the real of grief, the whole grief, and nothing but the grief. This Too Shall Suck podcast, a fresh perspective on grief, starts now. Now, now, now. Hey, hey, guys. So, welcome back. (laughs) <laughs> welcome back. If you are joining again, welcome back. I love you guys. Thank you so much for being here. If this is your first time here, welcome. Thank you so much for being here. Um, I know you're probably looking at the title like, Wait, what are we about to talk about? Um, we're going to dive into it. We're going to talk about funerals and understanding that. Um, and I know you're probably like, oh, I don't want to go into this gruesome topic. But again, Y'all already know if you are rolling with this Two Just Like podcast that it's not even about all that, right? Um, yes, there's emotions that come out with it. And yes, there's things that happen. But it's something that we need to talk about. Just like with estate planning, we need to have the conversation to understand that we need to, I don't want to say pre-plan our funerals. I think it's really important. Now, you know, we'll kind of dive into that. But I have a guest on. She is a millennial. Um, We have known each other for a very long time and she is a funeral director. And I think she just does a really good job of walking through what you're supposed to do and certain things that you can do and that it doesn't have to be this ridiculous process. And I think what it is, is honestly, you don't know what you don't know, as I always say. And um, I, I'll say with my mom, when we had to uh, bury her, there was just a lot of things that we didn't know because I never had to bury someone. Um, you know, I think when my my dad was younger, he had to uh, bury his mom. But it, I don't know, it just wasn't the same. Things just change, obviously, with time. Um, and so there was just a lot of things that I didn't know. Um, that I still, you know, am learning that I learned when I had my interview with Michelle, who's the funeral director, who's going to be on. Right. And and it's just good to be able to have the conversation and it doesn't have to be so sad and negative And oh, my God, who wants to plan their funeral? That's gruesome. No, it's a real life conversation that needs to happen because, again, I you, you need to think about the people that you're leaving behind and how important it is to make sure that they're okay, right? Um, because they're the ones who are going to be reeling and with all the feelings and the emotions. And so to try and make it as easy as possible for them um, to be able to make some arrangements for you is really, really important. And so I found this really awesome article. I might, you know what, I think I'm gonna post it in the show notes. It's a really, um, it's a really good article that just goes over um, just some different tips that I'm going to pull out. But it's called Why Millennials Are the Death Positive Generation. Um, and I think it, it was in, let's see, it was in 2020 that they wrote this. And it just had so many just amazing points. And I pulled out some of them. Um, but I, yeah, I'm going to link it in the show notes because you guys should really read it. It's actually a really, really good article just talking about just generation and how we are kind of changing the death industry um, and not making it again, such a thing. Like we have to normalize this. I'm going to say this probably every episode at this point, we have to normalize these conversations like period, you know, especially as millennials, as the generation that our parents are getting older, we're having grandparents and we are in the middle of a freaking pandemic. And so, you know, like we have to have conversations about these things. And so um, I wanted to just talk about a couple of the points that I pulled out from this article um, before we get into this interview with Michelle. But um, the first thing is in 2017, Health Affairs Journal did a survey and they found out one in three adults had a medical directive. Um, And so I think we talked a little bit about that on the estate planning episode. So if you haven't listened to that, go back and listen to episode one of this season. And we talk a little bit about that, but basically a medical directive says like in the, in the, um, if I can't take care of, like if I'm in the hospital, right. And I, um, cannot speak, I cannot do these things. Like you have this medical directive, 
written out. So like a DNR is a do not resuscitate. So you can have that in there like, hey, at any cost, like if I code or if I, I don't know if that's the proper word, but coding is what it is, is when you uh, like all of the functions stop. I'm sure my sister's listening to this and like, girl, that is not the proper word. But basically, like if they have to resuscitate you, do everything necessary to resuscitate me. Um, That was a conversation we had to have with my dad of like, do you want a DNR? Because some people do do a DNR. Like if they're just like, listen, I'm so sick. Like, don't bring me back. Like, just let me go in peace and I'm cool. Um, But with my dad, we had a conversation. He's like, I want you to try everything you can to resuscitate me, to bring me back until it just gets to a point where it's just becoming too much. And that's what happened. They resuscitated him three times. Um, No, I'm sorry. They resuscitated him twice. The third time it was just like, all right, he's clearly trying to go. And like he's clearly trying to go and we're not letting him go. And so, you know, we just had to make that decision. But, um, you know, you can put in there like, hey, I don't want to be resuscitated. Just let me go in peace and just let it be. Um, or you can put in there like try, you know, to resuscitate me up until this certain point and then, um, you know, just let me go in peace. And so um, in two, again, this is in 2017, one in three adults only had it. So a lot of people didn't even have that. So if you were in a situation where you were at the hospital and something were to happen, you don't know what to tell the doctors, like you're just going off of what you feel, not necessarily what that person feels. So it's really important to have that. And in your medical directive, you can put your end of life medical instructions. And so if you want your organs to be donated to science, you can put that in there. If you want them to do an autopsy, you can put that in there. If you want to go to a certain funeral home, you can put that in there, right? All of these things. And so when you're in the midst of things happening and you're like, I don't really remember, all of that can be in the medical directive. And so, um, again, that was in uh, 2017, only one in three people. Now, of course, that number has gone up since 2020, which we talked about in the estate planning episode. But, um, you know, it it was just I saw that and I'm like, huh. Because honestly, like, I'm gonna just be like completely transparent. We got my dad's medical directive done a week before, a week before he passed, like we got his medical directive done and we got his power of attorney done. Cause I kept saying like, dad, we need to get this done. We need to get this done. And my sister came down and we sat there in the hospital with him, got it done and got it uh, notarized. And then a week later he passed. So it was crazy. But another fact that they had is only 21% of Americans have spoken to their loved ones about their wishes. And that's from the National Funeral Directors Association. Um, And so I think, again, like people don't know what you want when you pass. Like, again, this happened a week before my dad's funeral, I said, or before he passed. I was like, dad, what do you like? What would you like your funeral to be like if something were to happen to you? He was like, I want a shiny blue casket. I want to play parliament flashlight. I don't want no sad shit. I want it to be a celebration of life. And we, you know, we laughed about it. And he was like, I want to, you know, and we were like, okay, all right. If that's what you want. A week later, he passed. And guess what he got? He got a shiny blue casket. And we played a parliament flashlight when we walked out of the funeral because that's what he said he wanted. We had a big repast afterwards at the house. It was a DJ. It was barbecue. It was everything that he wanted because he told us that's what he wanted. He didn't want nothing sad. He didn't want any of that. So he told us what we wanted. But if you don't have that conversation with people, how do they know what you want? Right? Like, you you can put together in your mind what you think they would want. But if it's like, listen, I want a pink casket. I want my hair to be laid. I want my face to be beat. OK, like I need all of that. Like you got to have those conversations. Um, and so I kind of want to talk about like this, um, you know, how it's how we've as a generation have become more uh, uh, death positive. And so there is a um is this a group? No, it's an organization called Order of the Good Death, which she promotes death, death, excuse me, death positivity, which I think is awesome. And then there's also this app called We Crook, which reminds 30,000 users. It has 30,000 users or actually I think 300,000 users. It has 300,000 users and it sends them a reminder up to five times a day that they're going to die. And I at first I was like, Mm-mm, I don't want to be like, 
you know, working out and it's like, hey, just a reminder, you're going to die. But their point is, is that it just helps them. It helps people to live in the moment. And when you click on it, it actually gives you like some different inspirational quotes and things like that. But it, it may come at the right time. You may be in a moment where you're at high stress and then you look at your phone. And it's like, hey, just a reminder, like you're going to die one day. So this crap probably doesn't matter. And then you open it up and it gives you some inspiration. So I actually thought that was really a really, really dope idea once I looked more into it. And then there's a group called The Dinner Party, uh, which is is a boozier take on an old fashioned support group. And it caters, of course, to like the 20s and 30s um, group of people who have lost a loved one. So to be able to have that support group and not, again, like sit in the room like, hi, my name is Lauren. Hi, Lauren. You know, it gives more of just like a more... um uh, I don't I don't want to say like more open and vulnerable because I think you do that in any support group where you're dealing with the loss of a loved one or grieving at any moment. Um, but it, it just gives it a more millennial approach to be able to have those open conversations. And so um, another point is the National Funeral Directors Association found that 15.8 percent of Americans from the ages of 18 to 39 think people should pre-plan their funerals before they're 40, while only 7.9 percent of people over 60 believe that. And so I just think that's, again, so interesting. Like the generation that we're in, we're like, yeah, like you need to like pre-plan your funeral. And Michelle's going to talk about that, how you can actually um, pay for burial expenses literally now, like how you pay for life insurance is the same thing for burial expenses. And so that by the time you pass, your funeral is paid for. And that's one less thing that your family has to worry about. Um, and so I just, I just really thought that was interesting that like, again, like I'm just going to say our parents and my parents would have been in their 60s. Like they're just like, yeah, like, no, you don't need to pre-plan your funeral. Like they don't think about that stuff. But our generation is like, no, we need to have these conversations. We need to think about these things. You need to have your funeral pre-planned. If you can pay for bare expenses, you need to do that. But at least have it written down and have it in a place that if something were to happen, that people know exactly what your wishes are, exactly what you want to do. And so, of course, I wanted to know why. And so it talked about the reasons why. And some of the reasons are also the top three reasons why were practical concerns. And when they said practical concerns, millennials said, you know, of course, the crushing debt that you have and the things um, that, again, that your family's going to have to pay for and things like climate change. And let's uh, let's go ahead and throw in a pandemic in there and people just, you know, passing away like that. So practical concerns are a reason why social factors are also a reason why. So, you know, the whole wellness culture and um, the mental health culture, just making sure that you are mentally okay and your family's going to be mentally okay to be able to do that. And also um, for some diverse spiritual practices. So uh, for people who have a specific way they want to do things, whether it's Buddhism, whether it's Christianity, whether it's whatever it is, um, they believe these social factors are a reason why they believe that you should have your funeral pre-planned because if your family is like super Christian and that wasn't who you are and they're going to create or uh, hold this you know, beautiful Christian ceremony, but that's not what you wanted, then yeah, like I need to make sure like my stuff is pre-planned, right? And the third reason is to curate their afterlives. <laughs> of course, like we are the generation of curators. So I want my funeral to be curated in a way that I would love, like period, you know, so it may be a little control. Maybe we all have control issues, <laughs> you know, but at the end of the day, I want to be able to curate my life the way that I wanted it to be. Um, and so the creator of that group, or excuse me, that organization Order of the Good Death that promotes um, death positivity, she said a really uh, nice quote um, that I'm like, yes. Um, she said, we are a generation that is less willing to be shamed for our interest in different topics or taboo topics. So again, obviously being here, me being a millennial, talking about grief, taboo topic and our interest in it. I'm very interested in obviously because it's something that I lived through um, and just wanting to understand it more and to help people with that. And so I'm really excited to get into this interview with Michelle and to just talk about her grieving journey and how she got into the funeral industry and just learning some things uh, about it um, to, to help you uh, maybe pre-plan your funeral or have the conversations with your family and friends to open up that dialogue to be able to have that conversation. And so I'm going to get into this break. We're going to pay some bills real quick and then we're going to get into this interview. This 
This week's episode is sponsored by Anchor. If you haven't heard about Anchor, it's the easiest way to make a podcast. Let me explain. Number one, it is free. That means no monthly subscriptions, no hidden fees. It is free 99. There's creation tools that allow you to record and edit your podcast right from your phone or computer. So you don't have to buy all this equipment that I decided to buy. You can do it right from your phone or computer. And Anchor will distribute your podcast for you. So it's so easy for me to upload an episode and it can be heard on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and many, many more. And you can actually make money from your podcast with no minimum listenership. It's everything you need to make a podcast in one place. Download the free Anchor app or go to anchor.fm to get started. And let's get into the show. All right, you guys, we are back and I'm super excited to have this next guest on. We've actually known each other for a (laughs) while. We were in a good old network marketing company together. (laughs) We're not going to talk about them days. Not going to get into it, Lord. That's a whole nother. mm. Anyways, but okay. It was a good time when it was in there, but we're not going to do it. It was. It was. It it was good when it was there, but child, it's it's enough for me moving forward. But I'm excited to have her on. So I'm going to read a quick bio and then we're going to get into it. Uh, Michelle Adams was born May 5th, 1988 in Seoul, Korea and moved to Savannah, Georgia in 1993 after her father retired from the Air Force. In 2012, she graduated from Savannah State University with a Bachelor of Science in Biology. And in 2017, she received her associate degree in funeral service education. She is a licensed funeral director and embalmer in the state of Georgia, a member of National Funeral Directors and Morticians Association, Georgia Funeral Service Practitioners Association, Ogeechee Tech Funeral Service Education Board member, Savannah State University Foundation Board member, and affiliated with Adam Funeral Services, Inc. in Savannah, Georgia, a family-owned and operated business. In her free time, she likes to spend time with her husband and two beautiful boys and enjoys traveling and new dining experiences. So without further ado, I'd like to welcome Miss Michelle Adams to the show. <laughs> hey, girl. Right, okay, right. Like, woo, 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 woo. that's okay. I'm gonna tell my producer, put some like, burr, burr, burr. like I'm gonna make it a whole party, girl. Thank you right. so much for being here. I appreciate it. Um, you know, I know it's one of those things people don't like to talk about. So I know they probably saw this episode. I was like, I don't want to talk about funerals, but you got to because it's a it's a thing that's going to happen. So like, yeah. I think it's important for people to understand, especially if you haven't planned one, because there was a lot of things that I didn't know, you know, planning my mother's. And I was like, a what and a who and a who? And you got to do what? And what does that cost? You're and right. what? Like, it's just so much that you don't know. And so yeah. um, I wanted to bring you on just because obviously I know you and I know that you're doing well. And I know you have your own story with grief. You know, we have our our uh, connection with, you know, losing our mothers, not uh, mm-hmm. too far from each other. So um You know, I thought it was important to talk about that for someone who has been in the process and, you know, is is now in planning funerals. So um, I first wanted to start. My first question is because, I again, obviously, we're talking about grief. So I wanted you to share um, your own personal journey with grief for people to understand, you know, although you do do this all the time, you do have your own personal story with it. So if you don't mind sharing that with the people. Yeah, so um, up until my mom, of course, passed away. She passed away September 2016. Um, I didn't really experience grief directly Mm. in that capacity. It was always um, an indirect type of loss. So, you know, people that were close to me um, losing their mothers or fathers or classmates or some of my mother's friends or my dad's friends. So. I, I didn't really have, you know, like that, that grief experience to where um, it became part of my everyday life. Um, so my mom was diagnosed with lung cancer at the beginning of 2015. Mm-hmm. And I was, you know, in the midst of planning a wedding, you know, the happiest moment of my life. Yeah. And then dealing with my mom's diagnosis and her having to go to chemotherapy and um, radiation Monday through Friday until like, I think she started in February and her last treatment of that plan was in May. So that, you know, right there, when she got diagnosed, it was like, you automatically think, oh, she's going to die. <laughs> you know mm-hmm. what I'm saying? Yeah. And so it was kind of like a death sentence 
but I had to remind myself that it wasn't. Mm. It was, you know, methods to treat it, um, methods to stop the cancer from growing. And that was our life at that moment. And, you know, I couldn't, I felt guilty about being happy, mm. you know, with planning the wedding. But then I felt guilty about being sad, about, you know, my, what my mom was going through. So it was kind of like a tug of war in my emotions. Mm. So after her treatment plan in May um, ended, you know, they did a scan and everything like that. And it didn't help. It didn't help. Um, it probably slowed down the process of the cancer spreading, but it still showed up in different spots. So um, her doctor gave her another treatment plan. And that kind of slowed it down a little more. And then she um, started doing this immunotherapy mm-hmm. type of chemotherapy. Yeah, my mom did the same thing. I know exactly what it yeah. is. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh-huh. And it was called Optivo. So every time I see the commercial now, I'm like, damn you, Optivo. <laughs> <laughs> Change the channel. <laughs> but yeah, it was Optivo. It was supposed to help her immune system. Um stop the growth of cells that were growing at a um, fast rate, right? Which is cancer. Mm -hmm. But in turn, you still have healthy cells in your body that multiply at a fast rate. So um, the battle there was if it'll attack healthy cells or if it will attack the cells that it needed to attack. Right. Right. So what happened was it started attacking healthy cells. (sighs) And um, so let's let's rewind a little bit. So we got married in November of 2015. She had this, just finished her second treatment plan. And then that's when she went in for another scan and then started the um, immunotherapy drug. Um, so, you know, I was married, trying to live my life. Right. At the same time, you know, I know that I needed to be there for my mom. So. It was just, you know, like being a newlywed and then being a daughter, you know, Mm -hmm. I was just trying to be in a lot of places at one time. And I still was driving an hour um, once a week to go, you know, to be in class, sit in class to Statesboro. I'll get you second to Statesboro. So I was going through all of these different things at one time. You know, when it, what what do you say? When it rains, it pours. Mm -hmm. (laughs) I had a lot on my plate. Yeah. Um, So. Starting my second semester in funeral service education, um, part of the curriculum is taking a grief counseling class. Mm-hmm. And this is when my mother's health started to spiral down. Like she was in and out of the hospital so much and they couldn't figure out what was happening. And just learning about grief, you know, with a person who is dying and a person who's experiencing a loved one dying, I kind of like had these out of body experiences like oh I know what that is mm. or you know just seeing how my mom would react to different things experiencing her own mortality mm. um was a learning experience for me and I felt like it was sort of therapeutic that I knew exactly what was happening yeah. you know yeah. I mean I was still very sad nonetheless but I feel like for me being a learner and an observer um, it kind of took my mind off what the hell was really about to happen. Right. You know what I'm saying? Right. So um I found out I was expecting. My husband and I found out we were expecting August of 2016. And then my mom, she passed away that following September, like maybe three weeks later. Mm. She knew I was pregnant. She said it was gonna be a boy <laughs> and all kind of things. Um, but you know, while I I was really sad about it. She was kind of at that point in her own grief where she accepted it um, and she was just grateful Mm. for the experiences she had in life. Sorry, girl, I got emotional for a second. (laughs) I got a little emotional for a second. (laughs) My bad, girl. So, (laughs) you know, that that helped me um, knowing that she wasn't that yeah you know what I'm saying and just seeing her wither away to nothing she had a a perforated bowel so she couldn't eat anything she could hardly drink anything she had a GI tube that was basically helping her live Mm. 
And when they finally found the preparation, you know, they offered her surgery, but um, they wasn't sure that she would survive. Mm. So her choice was to just come home. She wanted to come home. Yeah. She didn't want to, you know, have to transition under anesthesia in a operating room. That, yeah. that wasn't what she wanted. That wasn't what she pictured. So we brought her home and she was home at about 3.30 um, on a Sunday. And by Monday at noon, she was gone. Oh like it gosh. happened wow. really, really fast. Yeah. And even when we were, you know, um, doing the hospice paperwork, it was a, a friend of mine that I knew that worked for a hospice service. And I called her. And of course, you know, like people are good. And, and I think that's what we forget. People are really good. Mm hmm. And she was so good to me. Like she made it so easy. She set up everything to where I had, you know, we had the best nurses come by and check on my mom. Everything was just so very easy. Um, but even I said to her, I was like, you know, I know this is, this isn't, um, uh, she, she's not gonna, I mean, it's, it's you know, it's, it's, what is it? Um, hospice is not a death sentence mm. it's just you know y'all are just gonna keep her comfortable yeah, so yeah. she she was like you know besides what we, we got going on right now how are you and i'm like oh i'm good you know yeah. she's home. this is what she yeah, wants that denial she's phase. not gonna die That's or anything what... like that, that I mean, denial y'all is make real. Her comfortable, right mm-hmm. and then the next day you know i had thing, uh, um i had a va event that i had to go to and I made sure that I told them either I'm going to be late or I'm going to have to leave early because mom just came home. And it's so many things I regret mm-hmm. about that. So I ended up going, but I, but I stayed for like an hour. So I ended up having to leave. Um, and I know it's, it's things that I can't change. Right. But yet and still, you know, you look back on a whole lot. Like, yeah. even when I was in high school and college and my mom would call me, and I would be like, oh, you know, I'll call her back. Yeah. And then she would end up being worried. <laughs> yeah. When I finally would call her, she'd be like, oh, I'm calling you all day. <laughs> yeah. Like simple things like that, yeah. you know, that you realize you take for granted. Mm-hmm. Like I would, I don't know what I would do just to get a phone call from her. That's it. At this point in my life, you know, being an adult without a mom and being a mom myself now, you know, it's a whole different ball game when I look at my children. Like, I don't know how she really felt deep inside about leaving her children behind. She seemed okay with it Mm -hmm. because, I mean, that was the card she was dealt. But now me having these little cute little babies, like, I couldn't imagine leaving them. Yeah, You know what I'm saying? Yeah, And it makes me not only sad for myself, but sad for her. Um, So I had my baby. And that was oh, like in the delivery room after he came out, I was a whole mess. Like, yeah. I just remember, I just felt, I didn't, I did it naturally. I didn't have any drugs, but I felt high <laughs> when he came out. <laughs> like high. I don't know. I just remember screaming for my mom oh. and asking my husband, why wasn't she there? Oh. I couldn't, I had a hard time looking at my baby. Mm. And then when I finally looked, looked at him, I just, I saw her. And that made it even worse. I did. But then, like, you know, bringing him home and his first birthday when he started talking, everything was a happy occasion, but it was just so sad. Like, I felt like something was stolen from me, something was robbed from me. Mm. And so, you know, mentally, just me trying to put that stuff under the rug and be happy and be in the moment of having a healthy child and being able to care for him and, you know, having a husband that loves me, having great friends around me, great people around. It was so easy for me to put what I needed to do for myself aside. And I noticed that I started placing my mom in like just the, the her, the, the image of her mm-hmm. in things, like even bringing him home. You know, I'm like, my mom would be here. If she if she was alive, she would have been here. And she would have been sleeping right there in that guest room. Mm-hmm. You know, she would have been up every morning making her coffee. Um, she would have been giving him baths, let allowing me to have a moment to myself. 
And that just kept going on and on and on and on. And his first birthday, I'm like, oh, she would have been helping me cook food. She loved cooking. Yeah. She would have cooked some, you know, bulgogi. She would have had some kimchi. She would have had a whole spread. Yes. And then it started changing to, you know, me thinking, oh, what if somebody else would have died in order for her to stay here? Mm. Like this it was twisted. It, it was mm. weird. Yeah. AF. Yeah. And, you know, at that point, I'm like, oh, God, I need to go talk to somebody. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, in the Black community, it's kind of like we're ashamed of that. Oh, yeah. You're not going to therapy. You ain't crazy. You don't need to go to therapy. What? Right. You need to pray. <laughs> you need to go to church. Okay. If you need somebody to talk to, call me. I but need I Jesus need somebody, and therapy. Okay. Right. Shoot. So, um, I didn't tell, I didn't tell my husband about it, um, about, you know, me finding a therapist or whatever. I didn't tell many people. I didn't tell my dad. I didn't tell my sister. The only person that knew was, um, my cousin Kali mm. and she had, you know, lost her mother years ago and shared with me that she finally had to just like, listen, I need to go talk to somebody. Yeah. So it was very reassuring that somebody, you know, my big cousin who I looked up to did it and is doing it and is seeing, you know, things changing in her life. So reluctantly, <laughs> <laughs> I found someone and I started going and um, the first session was, oh my God, like, I think I used a whole box of tissues. I was apologizing <laughs> for yeah, crying all over the yeah, place. And all that was me. Oh, that was so sorry. <laughs> she was like, what are you talking about? <laughs> <laughs> but it was so draining. Mm. Like, it was the most draining experience ever. But I felt so empty, like, not empty in a bad way, but empty, like, I was holding in so much yeah. that I finally was able to let out. Yeah. So the second session, third session, you know, moving forward, it got a little better to where I was able to explore my um, emotions and my feelings in a way that, um, you know, like if I express something to her, she kind of shot it back at me, but she didn't give me the answer. Yes. You know, like, yes. it's not like she had this secret sauce. She just kind of like, shot what I was saying back at me and asked me questions about things that I was telling her that made me explore my own mental mm -hmm. state and my own emotions. Um, and she reassured me, like, you're not guilty for, you know, thinking the things that you think or um, being happy about something and sad at the same time about something else. Like, that's, that's just how it is. You know, it's not a linear path. It's this and that and that and this, and it's all over the place. And that's okay. Mm -hmm. And so, um, you know, a lot of things change. Like, I, um, not, I, I don't want to call it cold hearted, but at that point in my life, I knew that it was things that I couldn't control. Yeah. My mom, she was very healthy. She was a smoker maybe like 20 years ago, and she stopped smoking. She, you know, ate right. She exercised. Right. She worked hard. She was very giving. She was just a really good, wholesome person. And when she got sick, it was nothing I can do about it. Yeah. Yeah. There's things in life that you have no control over. But there are things that you have some control over. And so I started to kind of like, you know, realize I'm not going to be around these people or groups of people or any situation where I don't want to. That's you know, if it doesn't make me happy or contribute to my mental health. Then I got to stand up and I got to say, no, I have to create boundaries with my children, with my husband, mm -hmm. with people in general, with my friends. Mm -hmm. um, because, you know, at, at at this point, I'm responsible for my happiness. That's None right. of y'all are. That's right. And, you know, some people, they didn't like it. And some people understood it. Yeah. And it just put me in a place where I'm like, you know, I'm just I'm going to surround myself by things and people and places that make me happy and if you ain't for it then I'm sorry okay um you know and you know at this point uh I've accepted the fact that grief is not something that ends 
Oh no. It's going to be forever. Yeah. You know, um, my mom was part of my normal life. So it, it's not the fact that she died. Everybody has to die. And I see it every day, you know, right. everybody has to die. It's about the attachment you have to that person mm-hmm. that results in, um, your experience with them not being there. Yeah. You know, and I was super duper, super attached to my mom. Like, oh my God, I, I can't even explain it. And because she's not here, I understand that's why that's why I was having or I am having this type of experience. Mm-hmm. And um I can just I just have to learn to live through it and, you know, write my own chapters in my own book. That was her book. This is mine. And that's going to be part of it forever. Girl, that's no. me. All the, <laughs> listen, I'm over here like, ma'am, first of all, don't get me emotional like that. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I mean, you you said so many things there. I mean, like you said, um, death is going to happen. It is what it is. You know, it's inevitable for all of us. But all grief is, is I tell people all the time, it's like a it's you're driving a car right and grief is a passenger and you can decide if you wanted to drive change the gps it can do everything it wants to do distract you it's just if you're gonna let it drive is when it becomes like really like you said at the moment you were like i need to talk to somebody because you're letting like i'm letting this sucker drive and i don't know how to like get it out of my driver's Mm -hmm. seat like i need it to get off of me please because you're always going to be there that's cool you can distract me you can but no i'm not I'm not like I know how to adjust and, you know, exactly and just live with it. You know, when people are like grief gets, you know, it's easy. No, it never gets easy. You learn to adjust to what your new Mm -hmm. normal is, because like you said, your norm for you is your mom, like your mom being there. And oh, my God, when you were talking about being in that delivery room, I think about that all the time of like when I have a child, like I, I don't know. Like, I don't know. Like you said, it's supposed to be a happy moment when I get married. Like, I think about all of these things, not having yeah. my dad walking down the aisle, not having my mom there. Like, I think about all these things, yeah. you know what I mean? So I completely, completely understand, girl. So thank you for um, just being vulnerable and, and open and honest, because I know that wasn't easy for you. I know we talked about it like, oh, I'm not no. going to cry. <laughs> <laughs> I always tell people when I come on here, I'm like, I'm very sorry. This is kind of like a therapy session. So you might cry a little bit. It's not me. (laughs) But no, I mean, but I think it gives good insight into the person of who you are. So um, I want to talk about a couple of things. We'll get into the funeral stuff. It's my show. Y'all can wait. So (laughs) because I I think um, I'm going to have a whole like show about therapy, but I wanted to talk about that just just a little bit. Like I said, we won't deep dive. Um, But um, when you said that you were when you were going to uh, therapy, you didn't like tell your husband, you didn't tell anybody. Is there a reason for that? Were you afraid? I don't want to say afraid, but did you feel like there was going to be some pushback on your end and you knew you need to do it? Like what allowed you to still be able to do it without like telling, you know, maybe the person who was obviously the person who was closest to you? Um, it it was a, a a combination of a lot of things. I didn't want, you know, of course you don't want anybody telling you, oh, well, you don't need that. Or I didn't want any questions being asked because mm. I didn't have the answer. I don't know why I'm doing this, but at this point I feel like I need to, I can't figure it out by myself, Yeah, you know? And, um, the whole thing about it being taboo in you know the black community mm-hmm. um i just i just wanted to just do it on my own and not have any outside um you know influences on it eventually <laughs> he did know cuz i would be you know going right. away <laughs> right. and you know he's like oh well where, where have you been going you know like every two weeks <laughs> right. at this time right. you coming right back but you you have an appointment and he he was very good about you know just kind of letting me be like when I would just cry he would just be there for me so but I think it got to a point where he was like where's she going at she's having a date or <laughs> okay yeah, every two weeks okay. at the same time what's up <laughs> and so when he asked me I was like I'm going to therapy he's like you know just oh yeah uh-huh it's, 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 it's just therapy and he was like oh okay and um <laughs> later on i want to say maybe the next day he was like no <laughs> about therapy. can we talk about this um, right you feel like you feel like you need it and i was like yeah i do um i said i don't you know i i, I don't have the answers for myself and you i'm, I'm just I'm, I'm having a hard time 
And he was like, okay, good. And that was it. Oh, good. That was, I was like, oh, that's it. <laughs> 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 but, you know, like, like I said, people, you have, ex- not expectations, but people are, are good to you. And they sometimes show out for you or, you know, do things that you don't expect them to do. And I'm learning to um, let my guard down with certain things mm. and allow people to help me or be there for me or accept, you know, their offers to even like buy me lunch or whatever. You know what I'm saying? And um, I feel like that's part of my growth too, because I've always allowed my mother to, you know, help me or Mm -hmm. I never had any type of feelings when I needed something and I went straight to her or, you know, I just felt like she was the person that I would allow myself to be everything and anything to vulnerable, mad, angry, but she's not here no more. So I kind of like, you know, was like, who, well, who do I run to? Who? Mm. And so that's a part of me doing the work, doing the grief work. Yeah. Um, and, you know, just sharing that with him, it allowed me to share that with some friends that, you know, were going through their own thing or just, just volunteer the information. Well, you know, I've been going through, ther- through therapy and it's helped a lot. I don't know if that's something that you're open to. Um, Cause I didn't have a lot of people that talked to me about it. And that's I just, right. you know, felt like it's, I feel like it's necessary to, to talk about it. It's, mm-hmm. it's not something that you should be ashamed of if you need mm-hmm. help from a, a scary stranger. <laughs> <laughs> not a scary stranger. That's hilarious. It's scary, girl. It was scary. It, yeah. Was scared. Yeah. Open it up because you coming out. They're like, so, and then you're just like, well. <laughs> I know. I was like, like, Tell I was, me about your experience okay. what you're going through. Oh, okay. Right. I was like, I was not planning on doing this at first. I was really coming in here to like, you know, I wasn't talking about all that. And then she's like, Do you feel guilty? <laughs> yeah. I was like, oh, this is it. The, Lauren, what? This is embarrassing. <laughs> no, yeah. it's 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 really good. So no, I, I think that's that's awesome. Like you said, you know, you were like, mm, I don't want to really have any pushback. And he was like, okay, cool. And you were like, oh, all right. Okay. Maybe I should have, <laughs> you know, that's, that's how it is though. You know, I think if you, like you said, surround yourself with the right people who, even if they're not like, oh, I'm not going to therapy, but even if they can just like listen to you and say, oh, well, this is what I learned in therapy or this is what has helped right. me, you know, and not be like, mm-hmm. well, what you need to go there for? Like, I think that's really important when it comes to therapy, especially like you said, in the black community, but child, I'll go down a whole rabbit hole. I'm not going to do that today. So <laughs> I want to get into like what um, got you into Um, I I know obviously you guys have a family owned and operated business, but what made you interested in that field of work? Because of course people assume funerals, sadness, death, da 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 da, you know, all of this stuff. But you know, I just think you're just a beautiful human being, like physically and you know, mentally. So I see you doing it and I'm like, huh. Okay, like that's cool because you know you're just used to seeing like all this stuff, child. But they got this show on Netflix about I don't even know what they even talking about. Oh the, yeah, 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 I'm yeah, right yeah. It's a girl, a mess. But so, what got you interested in getting in that field of work? Yeah, so I never was interested in death. I mean, who's interested in being around people who just lost someone that they love? Nobody, right? Right. right. <laughs> but you know, just. My husband and I, we've known each other since we were kids. Our dads are friends. Oh, that's funny. So, um, yeah. So every, like my grand, my dad's mother died when I was eight. And that was like my first experience with death. But anyway, um, my dad went to the funeral home that my husband's dad was managing at the time. Mm-hmm. And so every other person that, you know, hadn't had someone pass pass away around us my dad will always refer to them and you know he was just always lend a helping hand like oh yeah you know my good friend on the funeral home and he would go with them if they needed or whatever so we we became family friends mm-hmm. um and then you know becoming adults we kind of would see each other out and we begin you know dating or whatever <laughs> which was kind of weird <laughs> it was weird it was weird for everybody it was especially weird for my mom. She was like, wait a minute. 
why but why are you dating him i don't understand oh, right like, like y'all known each other since you were like two <laughs> like Weird. Cousin brother. right <laughs> <laughs> no like we would go to each other's house for cookouts and all type of stuff so it was a little weird but it worked you know right um but just being around him and his dad you know i saw that compassion that they had it mm. wasn't it wasn't just a business for them they had compassion they were determined to get it right every time for the family that you know they were caring for um and, and on the flip side of it they were always professional and they always had this really great work ethic mm. and all of those things I admired about it um so when our relationship you know was growing you know I'm thinking oh he just, he's the only child it's only him and his dad that are funeral directors my father-in-law is third generation and then my husband is fourth generation. So, you know, it got me thinking, if we get married, our children are basically legacies to this. You know, they can't not <laughs> be funeral directors. Like, they can't stop it now. And so we got, eventually got married. Um, well, we got engaged. And that's when the wheel started rolling in my head. You know, like, I'm like, if I'm going to be my husband's rib, he will need some help. Come He's going to need help with this real. business. You know what I'm saying? Right. So um, I started going to the funeral home. I, I was doing hair. I was a beautician at that time, mm-hmm. full time. So when families would need a beautician, of course, it was easy to call, you know, yeah. <laughs> me to right. come. And um, the families were so pleased. It wasn't like I'm just coming in and doing hair. Like I'm actually a beautician. I know how to get it done in the right way, make it look good. You know mm-hmm. what I'm saying? So, um, I started hanging out more and more around the funeral home and I'm like, you know, I, I can do this. And then I looked up Ogeechee. My husband went to Ogeechee Tech. My father-in-law, he went to Gutman Jones in Atlanta years and years ago. Mm-hmm. Um, but Ogeechee Tech was only a short drive away. Um, it was one day a week. The rest was online. I looked up the curriculum and right after we got married, I just kind of got all the paperwork I needed applied. I got accepted and mm-hmm. I started that following um, semester. Mm. I didn't, I'm, you know, I don't want to make it seem like I don't tell my husband nothing, but I didn't tell him this either. <laughs> 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 so, I just don't want to talk about stuff. You know, I can bring you good news. That's all. <laughs> Girls, I'm trying to come with a solution, not a problem. Thank you. Right. So I got my acceptance letter in the mail and I showed it to him and he called his dad and they were all excited. Um, but becoming a student again was difficult for me. Yeah. <laughs> because it's like once you, you know, I was a traditional college student before and this was a very untraditional type of school. And mm-hmm. I just, I was having a hard time, but I did very well with it and um it just you know I'm like I don't I don't know if I like it but I'm gonna do it anyway I'm gonna see and I absolutely loved it like the program the the um all the instructors they were just you know like you know, you know like you know directors but they were they were compassionate mm. they were very um understanding you know when my mom had they were very understanding very compassionate with me um they just were good people and that made a difference in my experience at that school. Um, so when I finally became licensed and I started doing funerals on my own, on my own, um, I cried at like my first three funerals. Oh, I'm sure. Cried. And my husband, he actually came to one with me and it was uh, uh, somebody I went to high school with. He had cancer mm. and he passed away. So it was a very, very, very sad situation. And he saw me cry, crying. And he was like, girl, what's wrong with you? You can't be crying in front of these people. You're supposed to be a funeral director. If, if you up here crying, what do you think that's going to do for them? Right. And I'm like, you know what? You're right. I got to get it together. I'm going to go in the back. You handle it. <laughs> I got to get it together. No, but for real, you know, like these people, they don't want to be in a funeral home planning a funeral. Mm-hmm. This is like the worst day, the worst days of their life right now. And anything you can say or do, you know, will just, they're just in a fragile state and it'll either tick them off or it'll make them cry. And then it's going to complicate the process of making arrangements. Mm -hmm. So I understood that you have to have this, this certain posture about yourself Mm -hmm. and certain professionalism. And it's not because 
you want to be without emotion, it's because they are looking to you to help them through mm-hmm. this. You know, they don't know what they're doing. They don't know how to plan a funeral. You are planning a funeral. They are telling you what you want. You're the facilitator. So you have to act as such. And so when I wrapped my mind around that, it became um, easier for me to get through funerals without crying. <laughs> Sometimes I still do. But, you know, like I knew that I was there for a certain reason. I wasn't there to grieve or cry with the family. It was it was their moment. And even though, um, you know, it brought emotions out of me of my own grief, especially when I see, you know, people lose their moms or things like that, you know, it just kind of makes me feel for my own situation. But I knew that I know that I'm there to get a job done. Um, But on the flip side of it, you know, being surrounded by that type of that type of thing every day, it, it does help me explore my own situation. and it helps me be more um, empathetic mm. in a different type of way. Um, it's a it's a male dominated industry, and you know I feel like females or women are just genetically made to have that nurturing spirit and that nurturing aspect yep. of um, you know of of just taking care of people. Yeah. Um. So me being, you know, just kind of getting these funerals done and having different families that were serving, you know, people would come up to me and compliment me. And I'm like, Oh no, I'm not, I'm not here for compliments. You know, like I'm here for this family. Right. So, <laughs> but I see now, you know, I have to, I had to understand I'm, I'm a woman and this is a male dominated industry. So, you know, it humbled me. It humbled me that people noticed that it's a male dominated industry. And when I, stepped up and introduced myself as the funeral director, um, it kind of opened a lot of people's eyes to women can do this, mm-hmm. you know? So it's, it's, it's empowering. It's, it's very, I feel very empowered um, by what I do. Um, I feel like with cosmetizing and getting people ready for the last look for their family, it's uh, for me not not refreshing in a sense, but I don't know. It makes me feel like okay, okay, God, I see what you're doing. Mm-hmm. Like I was made for this. This mm-hmm. is what I was supposed to be doing. Mm-hmm. You know. Yeah. Um. So I don't know. I come home every day and. I just feel like work is helping me get through life, Mm. you know, like helping people get through their bereavement period and um, their grief and experience of loss. It helps me through my own stuff in a sense. Yeah. I don't know if that makes sense. You know what I'm saying? No, no, totally. yeah, and and though I never saw myself doing this, I feel like this is where I need to be. And the timing of it just blows my mind away how everything was just so timed in such a way that now I can look back and, you know, really, really believe that everything happens for a reason. Yeah. Girl, we're going to get to preaching on here. Don't play with me, okay, (laughs) now? Tell people all the time, listen, it ain't your time, it's God's time, but it's always on time. Hey, shut up. Okay. Right, let me stop right. playing. No, for real. Let me stop because every time, you know, but I think that is, uh, you know, you said something there like you, it, you never see yourself doing something, you know, but you're helping people, like you said, in their moment of bereavement. Right. And I think your experience and just being a woman and like you said, really um, brings a different type of level of compassion because I had all men funeral directors at my mom and my dad's like we had one woman, but yeah. she was like the admin person. Super. I mean, every, yeah. uh, don't get me wrong. Everybody was very nice, but I can just imagine the difference just being with a woman and like, mm-hmm. you know, obviously a man just cause we just have different levels and it's totally fine, yeah. you know, yeah. but um, so shout out to you because again, like I know the, emotions that come with it obviously there's you know like me I'm a if you see me in a funeral home I'm just like 
all right, like, let's just get to the point, like what we need to do, you know, whatever. And then some people are not like that. And some people look at me like, how can you be like that? Do you care about this person? You know, it's a whole bunch of different, you know how it goes. Um, Yeah. (laughs) So for people who don't know, um, you know, anything about the funeral process, you know, God bless you. I'm glad you don't. But um, what would you say is something that they need to keep in mind when um, it comes to planning a funeral, because you don't know what you don't know, right? Like a lot of people don't know you can pay for your funeral up front and like have right. it done. Um, but what is something that you would say if somebody has to deal with it, that they should um, maybe questions they need to ask or things they need to think about when they're coming in to speak um, to a funeral director? Um, I think what makes planning a funeral complicated because it, it's you know we're we're there as professionals to make it as easy as possible right but something that makes it complicated is when um you have you know you, you have insurance you have an insurance policy or life insurance policy but the beneficiary that's listed has already passed on Oof. that makes it very complicated um or there was, you know, there was a name change and the person hadn't just updating paperwork and keeping your house in order. Mm. And that was something that um, I kind of, I don't know, realized when after my mom had, you know, my dad, he has this, he's, he's been in the military for 23 years. So he gets stuff done right now. <laughs> <laughs> um, so soon after my mom passed away, it was a bunch of paperwork that he just had to get done and he needed, you know, okay, I'm going to put you on this. I need you to meet me at the bank and blah, blah, blah. blah. I'm like, oh, oh that's shoot. Right. This, is, this is real. Right. <laughs> There's stuff that needs to get done right now, you know? Mm-hmm. And some people, they just kind of let that fall through the cracks. And even though... um even though we we can you know work through those things, it just makes it complicated. It just puts added stress on you know the family that they already don't need. Um, and a lot of people don't know that there there's life insurance and then there's burial insurance. Mm. So there's insurance to where you can just pay toward the funeral cost, and that's it. You can come and plan your funeral sign a contract to lock in that price so that, you know, when inflation occurs, it doesn't affect um, the pricing and you pay monthly. If you pay the whole contract out, great. If you don't and you pass away within five years or so, your funeral is paid for. That's right. It makes it so easy. It makes it so easy. And so we're, we're promoting that right now. We have an event planning specialist and she's amazing at it. Um, she is very knowledgeable and you know the people that come in to plan with her they're very grateful that they're able to do this for themselves not only for themselves but you know like just make it easier for if they're leaving children behind or you know grandchildren behind um another thing people don't realize that you know sometimes people don't have insurance or they don't have enough to pay for a whole funeral and pay for a cemetery spot, open and close and all kind of stuff. Mm-hmm. But a lot of people, what I noticed, a lot of people don't know that they can view, we can prepare and bomb casket dress. We can have a whole funeral service or viewing um, and then cremate afterwards. Mm. No, you know, I, I feel like that either. Yeah. That's really good for. So seeing your loved one, especially after in, you know, in our case, our mothers were sick. Right. And in, in, in my mind, instead of that being the last time or the last memory of her, my last memory of actually seeing her, my last visual memory of her was great. You know, she looked beautiful. Yeah. She yeah. didn't look like she was struggling. She didn't have that hospital gown on. She mm-hmm. didn't have a GI tube. And so that makes a difference in grief in the process of it um it it helps with mental health as well and so that is an option that people don't know they think you know i don't have a whole lot of money so i guess i'll just cremate um but no and we always offer that to them if you want to view or if you want to you know pay your last respects or give your family an opportunity to pay their last respects we can do that we can do that easily you know, you can rent a casket, 
we can you can bring clothes we'll dress your mom or your dad or whoever you can have a ceremony if you want you can just come to you and then we'll do a cremation and people are like oh for real yes yes I know that. yeah yeah i know yeah it's i mean you can do anything we've had <laughs> we've had someone want their husband um viewed in their house and we did that for them oh wow I don't yeah. know about all that. That stresses me out, but I don't, <laughs> well, I don't know about all that. It's a no for me, but hey, you know, whatever mm-hmm. you need for your closure, sis, your life. <laughs> I'm not in it. No, I did not know that. That's so good. Mm-hmm. Especially that burial expenses. Cause you know, it's so funny. My first episode, we talked about estate planning. Cause I, I tell people all the time, I tell all my friends, I'm like, get your life insurance, get your will, oh, get yeah. all of this stuff. Yeah. Like I've recently had to change over my life insurance. I'm annoyed by it, but it's fine. It is what it is. <laughs> but you know, it's just making sure, like you said, to not leave your loved ones in this disarray. Cause it can be a disarray. Let me tell you. Mm-hmm. So yeah. Um, I want to talk about a little bit about, I guess, the process, right? I know, like you said, it can be kind of whatever you want, but if someone comes in, you know, I know, again, for me, like we had to pick out the casket and, you know, bringing in the clothes and embalming. I didn't even knew what know what embalming was until, like you said, I saw my mom and I'm like, oh, she doesn't look like even my dad. I'm like, oh, his face isn't skinny anymore. And all of those yeah. things like. I, I just don't think people just understand what the process is, you know, because they see them and, you know, they're just like, where do I start? Where do I go? Do I just Google funeral director? And then like you handle everything. Do I come in? What paperwork do I need? Um, mm-hmm. You know, I definitely just want to try and give as much information as possible. If um, the occurrence, unfortunately, somebody is in that situation. Yeah. So um, I've never worked at another funeral home before, so I can only <laughs> tell you. <laughs> About what we do. I know, that's right. Come on, promo. (laughs) (laughs) But, you know, we definitely, like I said, we want to make it as easy as possible for the family. So once we get a notification from um, a hospital or, you know, a facility that someone has passed on and the family chooses Adam, Mm -hmm. um, we'll ask for the next of kin's information, you know, the deceased person's information, their location, and then we'll dispatch um, our employees to do something called a removal. And that's when we pick up the deceased person and their, you know, their remains and bring them into our care. And at that point, if the family is present, we'll go ahead and ask for permission to embalm. Most times, you know, it's verbal permission, of course, if we have it to where there's a contract, then we have them sign it because there's no reversing embalming. Um, Most times we get permission to embalm. Um, sometimes, you know, families are reluctant in cases where they this just happen and they don't really know what to do or, you know, in cases where in where in cases where they don't know the cause. So um, yeah. but in most cases, we do get permission and embalming. Um, it's a process that does not stop decomposition, but it slows down decomposition oh i always wondered i'm like yeah. do they do you like put something in there i never knew okay all right Learn something. yeah so it's, it disinfects and it slows down the decomposition um embalming fluid contains uh it's taking me back to, to what i'm <laughs> talking about right now <laughs> <laughs> yeah so embalming fluid contains humectants and surfactants that basically uh restore the person mm-hmm. in their in their skin a so color in, in your case back. their color yeah mm-hmm. yeah so some fluids are um more colorful like you know they get their pink they're more pink in hue some are less pink um but it'll make them look like it's blood well the goal is to make them look alive right like yeah sleeping. right so instead of their skin looking blue and grayed out it'll kind of make them look like it's blood running through the veins. So that's, that's the end goal of embalming, restoring disinfection. Um, and the sooner a person is embalmed, the better results that you have. Mm. So if you wait it out, the body starts to break down and it starts to decompose. And whenever embalming is done, it'll just catch it right at the point where it is and slow it down. Got it. So we always want to, and bomb as soon as we bring the person into our care. And after that, 
um, we'll go ahead and, you know, contact the next of kin and from, from the office, usually it's the office manager, contact the next of kin, set up an appointment for arrangement conference. And at that point over the phone, um, we'll kind of let them know, you know, what to bring any insurance policy information. Um, if the person is military, their DD 214, if you have it, um, social security number, you know, just have in mind a date. If you want a service, a place, um, we ask them about cemetery spaces. And if they, you know, have anything in mind, just just make sure you think about it so that when the conference comes, it's as easy and as quick as possible. We don't want to hold you forever. Right. Um, we also, the funeral home, file death certificates. Yes, they do. So we get the information, the, you know, the demographics in order to um, put on the death certificate. And that's like the person's name, the date of birth, date of death, social security number. Um, place of birth, their mother, father's name, occupation, all kind of stuff. So we do that and then we send it to whoever, the physician who is certifying the death and they'll fill out the cause of death, certify it, sign it, be a physician or a coroner. So we'll get it to the necessary person. And once they get that information back to us, we file it with the health department, the county health department. The, the death certificate has to be filed in the county of death. Okay, I didn't. And I, I think I think yeah, I think some people think that it has to be filed where the person is a resident of. But no, if they're like even if you're traveling or you know and you pass away where where you are, mm -hmm. the death certificate has to be filed there. Oh, I didn't know that. Okay. Mm -hmm. So we file it in the necessary or at the necessary health department, and then you're able to get copies. And um, of course, you know. You really can't do anything without a certified death certificate. Can't do nothing. You can't do nothing. Can't if you go to the bank and be like, "Child, just a mess. right." <laughs> if you go to the bank and be like, "Hey, you know, my family member died, and I need to close the bank account," or you go to Georgia Power, they're like, "Okay, do you have a death certificate?" Okay, and, you know, some people don't know. They don't. They just don't know. Mm -hmm. So we try to get those back to families as quick as possible. Sometimes it takes longer because these doctors are too busy. Girl, <laughs> now don't even talk to me about a child. <laughs> we had to get ours changed twice and they still got it wrong. Oh my God. Dumbass. Yeah, sometimes we've had doctors tell us, you know, like, I'm sorry, I'm trying to keep people alive. I'm not worried about the people that <laughs> are gone. <laughs> oh yeah, they're real nasty. So now what I do, I'll give the family the office number, the doctor's office number, and <laughs> I'll have them call me. And I, <laughs> I'll get better results. <laughs> okay. I'm calling, yeah. cursing you. I mean, yeah, you're right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. So um, that's something that's needed um, to get anything kind of, you know, clothes, insurance, cell phone, car. Anything. Anything. Anything, anything boy. So then after that, um, Traditionally, you know, with us, with the Black community, we like to view and we like to bury. Mm -hmm. So then we'll have the family give us all the things that, you know, their wishes as well as their loved one wishes if they knew. And then we'll plan um, a funeral. We'll, we'll select the date. We'll reach out to the church. We basically are facilitators. Mm -hmm. We'll reach out to the cemetery. Um, some cemeteries are super expensive and yes, some Lord. are very affordable some require a vault some don't yes lord they do i'm <laughs> oh, sorry and that's an added expense that's a whole nother added expense a cemetery you have to pay to have the grave open you have mm -hmm. to pay to have it closed mm -hmm. you have to pay for a vault it's just it's crazy um you have to pay for a headstone if you want mm -hmm. <laughs> but we we facilitate all of that um, so then the family will bring in the clothes and we'll have the person, they'll already be involved. Um, so we'll have the person dress and then, you know, at that point we'll already have a viewing day and time schedule where they come in for their first viewing. And that's just immediate family members or, you know, the next of kin so that they can prove how their loved ones look. Like if, you know, if it's a woman, they'll probably say, oh, I want to change these earrings out or they'll probably bring like glasses or you know put a pin on them or add a flower or something like that but at that point uh the family can tell us what they want changed or if they approve that the person can be um shown to the public you know the public can come and pay their respect yeah and you have somebody come in and do 
Because we had our own person come in and do like the makeup and then the hair for my mom. But do you guys yeah. have people who do that as well? Yeah, it's me. Okay. <laughs> she said, yeah, that would be I. <laughs> I know yeah, that's like, right. I'm starting to realize I do everything. <laughs> that girl said, I got the business to help and here I am. <laughs> right. <laughs> no, like on slow days where, you know, it's not much going on. Everything's kind of like done with paperwork. I'm around here running around trying to figure out <laughs> who, what death certificate I got to, you know, chase down or whatever. So, <laughs> yeah. Um, so I'm I'm the person in house that cosmetizes and everything like that. Um, if the family does have someone they want to bring in or if they want to do it themselves, we definitely allow that. We don't say no. Um, so but that, you know, on rare occasion, does that happen? Yeah, um, mostly with like younger, younger folks. You know, I can imagine, though, in. that's yeah, different, though, artist. like mm-hmm. doing makeup on a deceased person than obviously someone who's alive. Is that is there a difference like with skin and like you said, with the embalming and things like that? Yeah. So the skin is not pliable. It doesn't move. It, it's in place, basically. Embalming mm. fluid, you know, kind of freezes everything. So it's in place. Um, it doesn't make it difficult. It's just different. And we put a moisturizing cream on the face after embalming so that the skin on the face doesn't dry up. Got it. Okay. So sometimes it might, the moisturizer may moisturize a little too much and they look a little greasy, (laughs) which then we got to, you know, keep (laughs) dabbing. (laughs) But you don't, what you don't want is for a person to dehydrate. Yeah. You know, you don't want their lips to dehydrate or their eyelids to dehydrate. So you want to like, how the moisturizing cream on um it's it's different but it's it's not difficult and you know doing someone's hair laying down of course you, you're fighting against gravity yeah so. hairspray helps <laughs> and body help. okay um but for me you know because I don't know the person most times I don't know the person right the family will send pictures, you know, we'll post a picture on our website mm-hmm. and then, you know, if they want to send a picture to the newspaper um, as a newspaper notice, or they'll just send a bunch of other pictures for programs or a slideshow. I'll make sure I look at the pictures to kind of see how this person um, like to appear. Mm. You know what I'm saying? Because most pictures will be like, you know, at a wedding or they're dressed up. Some of them will be on a regular day. And so I want to see how they wear their hair. Like, do they like it out of their face? Do they like a part in the middle? Do they like their curls straight down? Um, Do they wear lipstick? Do they wear mascara? Do they like their eyebrows arched? Mm. Do they have natural bushy eyebrows? Um, So, you know, I like to do my research so that when the family comes in, this person don't, they don't look like, you know, somebody else. They look like themselves. Yes. That's always the goal. And sometimes, I have to step away for a minute and you know, sit at my office and do something else. And then I'll come back and I'll be like, oh, yeah, you did that, girl. <laughs> <laughs> Make sure they look like themselves. Oh, yep, they do. We're good. <laughs> right. <laughs> no, that's good. That's good. No, I think um, I think that's good. Like just going through the whole process. I think, like you said, people just don't understand those death certificates. Jesus, the offense. Yeah. All around me every day. Talking to life insurance. <laughs> My God, Father God. Mm-hmm. It's just, you know, it's it's lot. it's a whole lot. But like you said, I think it's in important to have the right funeral home because all funeral homes are not made the same. Let's just go ahead and yeah. throw that out there. Um, yeah. But, you know, it's it's really important for you to have the right one and to, you know, honestly, I wouldn't even say like start thinking about it. But if you know there's a funeral home like maybe in your area that you like and if, you know, you're married or something, of course, anything can happen, you know, you move right. or anything like that. But maybe, like you said, start having those conversations with them to start having some, you know, beer, uh, start paying your funeral off. So if something mm-hmm. does happen, then your family is like already good because they can go to they can go to you and say, you know what, like, we're good. You know, they already right. paid for it and you can be like, oh, I already got it. Don't worry about it. So, right. Um, it makes a difference. It, it makes a huge difference. Like, you know, we see families that stress out and they're ringing the phones off the hook. And then you have the families that have everything planned out or whose loved one had everything planned out. And they knew exactly what they wanted. And we have the file in the back. You can just grab it and just go. 
And, you know, we see a difference in um, how the families act, you know, like the, their yeah. stress levels, basically. Oh, yeah, I believe it. No, I absolutely mm-hmm. believe it. So I won't keep you all day. I know we've been on here a while. But <laughs> <laughs> I just think you just shared so so many uh, just amazing things. And so I just I really wanted people to to hear and to learn and to hear like it's not. It doesn't have to be a scary and, you know, crazy process. You know, obviously yeah. there's emotions that are involved with it. But I think having the right people in your corner, like you said, and and just having, you know, kind of an idea helps. So um, my last question to you is what um, I don't want to say what advice, but what do you say to those people who are going through the process or even somebody who's listening, who may go through the process, uh, you know, at some point in their life, obviously we're all going to, you know, have to peace out eventually. But um, what do you say to them when they're going through that process? Like as a funeral director, what do you say to those families who are in the process and coming to you for um, to to plan their loved ones um, celebration of life, as I call it? Um, just anyone that, you know, is grieving or that, that they lost someone, just feel all the feel, just mm, feel all mm. the feel. You know, I hate hearing people say, you gotta be strong, stay strong, stop all that crying, you're gonna get sick. No, you will get sick if you hold all of that in. You will physically get sick. You know, it, it definitely stresses you out and stress will definitely kill you just feel all the feels cry if you need to cry um seek out therapy if you need it you'll experience sadness anger you'll feel empty and none of that is unusual and and it's not wrong you know what i'm saying um i still find myself bursting into tears every now and again and it's the moment where i'm by myself with my own feelings and my thoughts you know I can do anything to kind of keep my mind off of things but when I'm alone or you know just in my closet sometimes when I'm in the shower in the car by myself I just burst out into tears Mm -hmm. and I have those holy shit moments like damn my mom is really good Mm -hmm. she is really not here and look at me I'm doing this doing something that I never thought I could do without her I'm actually doing life Mm -hmm. holy shit (laughs) (laughs) but feel everything that your emotions want you to feel it's not wrong and it actually helps it it helped me I was you know I had held in a whole lot and when I started to just kind of feel what may be or cry if I wanted to or scream if I wanted to that pressure just releasing it just kind of, you know, it, it it set me on a different wavelength. I, I don't I don't know how to explain it. It's weird. <laughs> <laughs> it's weird, but definitely don't um suppress any emotions. You know, people come in sometimes and they cry and they apologize, like I did in therapy, and we try to reassure uh, reassure them, like that's okay. Yeah, it's okay. Do you need a moment? Do you need me to step out? Um, some people come in and they argue. We've had people fight, and we just you know <laughs> y'all need a moment. <laughs> <laughs> we'll step out but feel everything that you want to feel because I mean you're human and you're sad and sometimes you don't feel okay and that's all right mm. oh that's good sometimes you don't feel okay and that's all right boom that's all right it's all right that's all right it, but I think <laughs> I mean that's real feel I tell people all the time just feel how you need to feel and it's okay and it's valid and right. let yourself process that go through it and then let's go on to the other side of it. We're good. Right. So. Right. You can't, you can't go around grief. You have to go through it, baby. You definitely have to go through it. That is a word for y'all. <laughs> and on that note, I would like to thank you so much for being here, girl. If You're they welcome. would like to reach out to you for your services, follow you on social media, where can they find you at? Uh, Instagram is at, Michelle, M-I-C-H-E-L-L-E underscore A underscore Adam. Or you all can visit our website at www.adamsfuneralservicesinc.com. I love it. Well, thank you again so much for being here. Thank you so much for being open, honest, vulnerable. (laughs) 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 All right. And for 
just helping people understand. So hopefully somebody going through the process. Now you can go back and have a conversation and say, you know what? Let's look at the burial expenses. So, right. yeah, no, I appreciate you, girl. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank you. Oh, my gosh. I didn't know how this was going to turn out. But I mean, I, I see. I see why you have this platform. I appreciate you. Oh. <laughs> Oh, that was so good. Oh, Michelle. Uh, No, that was good. And uh, I hope you guys learned something from it. Again, I know you probably were looking at this episode like, I don't want to talk about no funerals. I ain't got nobody dying. But it's important to talk about. I mean, if you're there's a theme going on this season. I'm not going to say that there's not a theme. There's kind of is a theme. You know what the theme is? Grief. <laughs> but no, like, um, you know, just from going to talk about estate planning and caregiving and things like that, I think it's important to in, in have these conversations as well. I, My biggest thing I think I wanted to portray this season um, and really talk about is talk like I'm really, really trying hard to normalize these conversations that we have to have, especially again in the black community as a as a black woman and as a, a millennial black woman. These are conversations we need to have, um, even if you're in your 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s. Like these are conversations that we need to have. We need to have conversations about planning our state. We need to have conversations about what ifs. We need to have conversations about funeral expenses, because these are things that people don't think about. I feel like that we live in this, um, what is it? We live in this kind of world of forever young, right? Because this is the stigma that's created. But again, if 2020 hasn't taught us anything, life is is precious. It's not promised to anyone. You know, we've lost so many lives, you know, from this pandemic and anything can happen. Um, you know, again, like, she said her mom was healthy. My mom was healthy, eating right. Like if you saw my mom, like it just didn't make sense that this woman who was so full of life, so full of joy, you know, eat, eating healthy, you know, was always that person got, you know, breast cancer. Like it just didn't, it just didn't make sense. Right. And so life is not promised when God calls you home. There's really, I mean, it, it's just time to go home. It just is what it is. Right. And so, um, you know, I, I just want to have these conversations so we can have these conversations with the people around us, with our loved ones, with our spouses, like friend groups, because it doesn't have to be a, a gruesome, sad, horrible conversation. It just doesn't like obviously we get, you know, Michelle and I got emotional on there just connecting on that level of losing our mothers. But you know, you see, we were laughing and stuff like that, because again, like these are normal conversations like, oh, no, I didn't know that. Or no, you need this or you need that. Like <laughs> these are things that are real. That death certificate thing is a real life thing. Let me tell you, it is it's out of control. But either way, like these are things that we need to talk about. So I hope that you took some good notes. I hope that uh, you were able to learn some different things about um, the embalming process, which are things, again, that I didn't necessarily know. I, I've heard of it, obviously, and I knew that they embalmed my mom and my dad, but I didn't I didn't I just know it made them look like themselves. I didn't understand the process behind it and the things that you need, um, you know, to bring in. I, well, I'll say my first time. The second time we kind of knew what we need to br- uh, bring in. But that first time we had no idea. And I didn't know that you could like do a whole kind of rent a casket and all of that and still cremate because funerals can get pricey. Not going to lie. You know what I mean? And so um, there's just a lot of different things that I think are good topics of conversation when you are having these conversations with your loved ones, with whatever, um, even when your friend group like, hey, have y'all um, um, thought about like what your funeral will look like for your family? And I know you're probably like, Lauren, who says that? What do you say that a cocktail at happy hour? But, you know, I don't know. I guess my friend group, we just have different conversations. But I think it's because like <laughs> I've been thrust into this situation of, you know, having to bury two parents and, and understanding the process. And so like, I'm way more comfortable having the conversation and they're open to it. Um, and so I think, again, that's really important to surround yourself with people who are open to that, because if you're thinking about the future, you have to think about, um, I don't want to say the what ifs, but you just have to make sure that you're good and your family is good. And whoever you want to be good, if something happens to you, you need to make sure that they're good because that's the only way that you're going to be able to, to, I don't want to say control things, but just make sure that they're good when you're gone. So, you know, if you are going through the process of 
currently um, planning a funeral um, for a loved one or um, if you are listening to this and you are going through the process, like she said, there's a lot of emotions. Just let yourself feel, you know, there was a lot of emotions that, um, you know, I had to go through. Me and my siblings had to go through and we just kind of let ourselves go. There was a lot of sadness, obviously, but there was anger in some moments. Um, you know, I felt guilty in some moments that I wasn't like laying on the floor and I was trying to get things done. There's a lot of emotions that you go through. And so, you know, as I always say, just be kind to yourself and give yourself grace, because if you don't, who will? <laughs> Thank you so much for listening to another week's episode, you guys. If you haven't already, follow me on social media at This Too Shall Suck podcast on Facebook and Instagram. If you are listening on Apple Podcasts, don't forget to rate, review, follow, and share with your family and friends. If you want to know more about me, check out my website at this 2 shotsuckpodcastcom and feel free to send me any questions or topics you want to hear at hello at this 2 shotsuckpodcastcom This episode was produced by Mike Sick and our original music is produced by Jimmy Samaj. As always, I love you guys. I'm sending you love and light in your life because you deserve it. I'll see you on the next episode. Mwah. 